So, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we pray your blessing upon your word this morning. We pray, Lord, that um, our hearts will be open to receive those things that you're speaking and confirming those things that have um, in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Well, let's see here. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of um, helping out at a uh, church, actually at a farm called Park Wood Farm, and they asked me, it was an outreach to the special needs community for the children that they work with, and so they asked me if I would bring the gospel message. And so in preparing that, I thought that I, um, I actually told the gospel message from the position of the Apostle Peter. So I actually found some clothing and some garb and got there, and it was actually quite a fun time, and I did a lot of reflection on Peter. And so that's um, where a lot of my message today, but I think we have on the screen a picture of me and another Peter sitting there, and that was uh, Peter Rabbit, Peter the Easter Rabbit. So, yeah, so it was a good time. That was my daughter. She uh, was the rabbit, and that, that's the, the other one's me. But nevertheless, um, it's, uh, it was fun. But in, in as much as so, I started checking out the Apostle Peter more than I ever had before. And as I do my message today, we're going to look at his life some, but something that came out even more so was in Christ's ministry, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, his first words and his last words. And they're very similar in how they cut through the gospel message. And I believe there's something there for us today. I know there's something for me. So, um... So I would like to start with reading Mark 1, 1 to 14. If you've got your Bibles, you could join me. And we're also going to be looking at Matthew 4 and 18. And, you know, I've been here before, and some of you may know that this is close to my heart. It's probably because I need it. But I have, um... Oh, shoot. <laughs> Thanks, A little bit higher. No, it's not your bed. That's good, yes. I got, I got bifocals, but sometimes there's that in-between point there where you got to use... Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Mark 1, 1 to 14. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about John the Baptist here. It says, In the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it was written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And then also in Matthew 4, 18. Uh, back up a little bit here. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Yeah, and this is it here. I, just, I don't want to get ahead of myself quite yet here. Uh, I'm going to read verse 17 here. Um, from that time, Jesus began to preach, rep rep repent, repeat. <laughs> you ever heard that story? If, if Pete and repeat were sitting on the fence and Pete fell off, who would be left? <laughs> repeat. <laughs> 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 so, all right. So it was, um, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And uh, John the Baptist preached that. It came out of the book of Isaiah. And... Um, Isaiah, and I'll turn there and read it. You don't have to. Mm. 
And I guess when it comes down to just this first theme here, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, you have two things, repentance and the kingdom of God. And the, the kingdom of God is a great thing that God wants us to enter into, not only now, but in eternal life. There are things here now for us that regard the kingdom of God and things that are to make us, to bless us, things that help us to mature, things to help us to grow, help us to walk out our Christian life. You know, there's, there's meaningful purpose as Christians to live their lives daily in their personal time, in their family time, and in their community time. We, make, we are the light of the world. We are a city set on a hill. Everybody here is uniquely qualified to meet the gifting that God's called you to, and it's just not for you. It's for others as well. But John was echoing something that Isaiah had said, I think some 400 years prior. And in Isaiah 40, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and that her sin has been paid for and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert place. A, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. And so John was in the wilderness preaching this same message, you know, prepare the way of the Lord. Christ had not come yet, but he was telling them to prepare for something that was going to happen that was going to affect all of them. And actually it affected us some 2,000 years later. But there's some qualifying things that they lay a foundation here. It says, one, you know, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. In, uh, in my um, traveling, I've gone to uh, Jamaica. It's one of the places I've been very fortunate to. And I've learned that um, many of the roads were very bad. And bad meaning that there were potholes so bad that you would have to go around them. And I mean, it was, it was bad. And I'd never been to a place such like that. And I remember um, my wife, Molly, her father, he was a community leader, a pastor, but he would take the effort to fill in those holes from construction, whether it be brick or rock, and it made life a whole lot easier trying to walk on the road. It made the path straight. And um, it's simple, but it's true. You know, if you had a car in Jamaica and you go in these potholes, your car gets beat up really bad. Um, I was there and I had a, somebody brought a Volvo over, an older one. And I can't remember their names, but he went up that road, and you could barely feel those potholes in his Volvo. And believe me, it left an impression. I've had a few Volvos, and I know that they're tough cars. But aside from that, they made the road straight. Another time, I was going from Seattle to Ohio, and I go to this town called Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Beautiful place. I love it. But in order to get through uh, I-90, you had to um, go through the town. And I remember one year as I was going through there, I saw them building this, um, in between two valleys, there was thousands and thousands, tons of gravel and dirt. They, I'm telling you, it must have been 40, 50 feet in the air. It was amazing. And the whole reason was to put a highway across there. And so here we have, it goes on, verse 4, Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places of the plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. This is the message of John the Baptist. He echoed the message for people to make straight. And I believe that the people, even in that time, they struggle with life many times like we might, with questions. They struggle with life, with relationships. And they were looking for some type of, of something to give them comfort, something to give them direction, something to where it would make their life easier. And so it said that they came out from the town to go see him. They took effort, and they heard that John was preaching a message of repentance. They went out there to repent and hope that they could set a foundation, level it out, so they could live a better life. And that's, um, that's a, a good thing. Uh, repentance has been on uh, a real strong theme of my life, maybe because I need it, and that it helps me to find my footing so I can move on. Um, something else that Isaiah talks about in the first words is, comfort and comfort my people. Um, we're going to find out when um, P 
Peter met Jesus when he first met him on the sea. And, um, well, I'll read it so we don't get, um, well, let's see here. There's this story where Peter was on the uh, Sea of Galilee, and he is fisherman with his brother, Peter, Andrew, and his uh, James and John. They were also fishermen, and they were rough men. Um, I've just done a little reading, but just from the story of Peter, he was not a very uh, shy man. He was not a very uh, a guy that probably brushed his teeth a lot, probably pretty rough. And when you came up to fishermen in those day and age, it was probably, uh, kids, you stay over here and I'll go buy the fish. You know, I don't want to have to mess with these guys. So in our story of uh, Peter, he, um, Jesus is going to um, start preaching repentance. Let me, that's where I left off here, Matthew 4. Matthew 4. So Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting nets into the lake. They were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. There's another account of this in the gospel where Jesus came down to the sea and he asked Peter to push off in his boat. And so Jesus pushed off and preached a message to the people. And when he was done, he told Peter to push his boat out into the deep for a catch. And Peter said, Lord, he says, we've been fishing all night and we haven't caught anything. And Jesus says, push off and put down your nets. And when they put down their nets, they caught such an amount of fish that he had to call other boats in to bring them in. And this, I don't know if it's from the words of Christ or the miracle, when Peter got done and he was before Jesus, he knelt down before Jesus and he says, go away from me, Jesus, I am a sinful man. And Jesus says, from now on, you will no longer be a fisherman, but you'll be a fisher of men. So there is a point here where Peter is recognizing his sinfulness. And Jesus, he didn't criticize him. He just says, your life's going to change. It's kind of like in Isaiah, says, comfort my people. You know, I really don't believe that God has, uh, and I don't think anybody here probably does, but God's not there looking for your wrongs to beat you on the head with it. Yeah, we have wrongs. We got, you know, we got that figured out. We all have our issues. But repentance is just an important, it's an important part of the foundation of the Christian to move forward. And it comes through humility too. You know, the Bible talks about humility and that um, it says God opposes the proud, but, you know, the humble he exalts. And so setting this as a foundation to move forward, Peter started to get it. And we're starting to get it. And as we move forward here, um, as Peter uh, also here, uh, Jesus also said, follow me. He didn't say, Peter, believe on me. I heard this the other day in a sermon where there's a difference between believing in Jesus and following Jesus. It doesn't cost a lot just to believe on Jesus, but it'll cost you to follow him. And so uh, I thought that was good. You know, we are followers of Christ. So... Um, on Peter's journey, um, there's a couple episodes, and if you guys can think of one, too, that you think might be pertinent, you can add to it. But just um, when Jesus had sent, um, he had fed the 5,000, he sent the apostles on a boat ahead of him, and that night they struggled all night, and then Jesus came and he walked on the water. And many of the apostles thought it was a ghost, but Jesus says, no, it is I. And Peter says, Lord, if that's you, call me. And the Lord called Peter, and he walked on the water. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, and when he saw the seas, he fell, and he cried out to Jesus, and Jesus immediately reached out his hand and saved him. He says, oh, ye of little faith. Uh, the Lord rebuked Peter a lot, but he still loved Peter a lot. 
And Peter felt that. You know, Peter almost has what's called his foot and mouth disease. He's also put, you know, he guy just had a, said the wrong things and did a lot of the wrong things, but that didn't change the course that he was on. And what I like about him, he was real. And God tells us to be real before him. You know, God, I, I, I don't like this, and I can, you know, this is wrong, but help me in my weakness. Um, another time when Jesus was talking about he um, was going to, uh, you know, go to the cross. He was going to die. And uh, Jesus, you know, Peter said, Not, don't let it be. And somewhere along the line, um, God, Jesus turned to Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. How about that for rebuke? You know, it's not, you know, you don't tell us that, get behind me, saint, and that's, I mean, whoa. But he told that to Peter. And uh, another thing, like, shoot, dude, I'm not getting this. Come on, Peter. And then another time, in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, Peter cut off the ear of one of the guards. And um, I know he had a zeal for the Jesus, but Jesus, he, he picked up the, the ear and he healed the guard. Um, and then one of the most prominent ones is that, uh, Peter denied the Lord three times that night, you know, before he was crucified. And um, Jesus told him that he would. And I, the part where when the cock crowed, Jesus looked at Peter. So apparently their eyes met. And it says, Peter, he wept bitterly. I don't know the last time I wept bitterly. Um, I have wept bitterly, and, but um, it must have been hard for Peter. You know, he was following Christ, but it seemed like he was getting it all wrong. He committed his life. He left everything, but he wasn't getting it right. And, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, there's times when I, I try hard, and I don't get it right. Matter of fact, sometimes I get so frustrated. You know, why am I so frustrated? I'm a Christian. Why, why does it seem so hard? Why am I not getting this? Why am I not getting over this? Um... You remember the commercials where they got something for 1995 and they say shipping and handling, but wait, come on, but wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. So, for, yeah, but wait, there's more. So here we have Peter. Wait, there's more. So it comes down to the last words of Christ, um, and we're going to look at Acts one, and then Luke 24. I brought a, um, a t-shirt here, and there's a word here that they use. Um, have you guys ever seen that? Swagger? Caleb, what does swagger mean? <laughs> yeah, it's the way you carry yourself. I think it's a good thing. And, you know, um, it's not my shirt. <laughs> Sorry. I don't wear this shirt, folks. But, you know, there is um, Peter, his life turned. And Peter got some serious swagger on him, dude. Peter got some swagger on him. And believe me, he didn't have it before, but you're going to see he's going to have swagger in just a few minutes. And um, the words of Christ. I know I just turned this ax. <laughs> the Bible just turned away. It must have been the T-shirt that turned it. I'm going to be reading from verse 1. In the former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his sufferings, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them for over a period of 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God, and on, on, on one occasion, he was eating with them and gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And Luke 24. Okay. 
2445. Kind of the same discourse here, but he adds something here to it. It says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what was written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached. And that's it. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in, in, in his name to all nations be given in Jerusalem. You are witness to these things. I am going to send you what the Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. It's an echo of what Jesus said in the beginning. Repent for the kingdom of God is hand. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. You know, preaching this message, teaching them. I think it's important enough that not just to, you know, it's important for ourselves to receive these things. Not that we have to tell people, but receive them. Repentance and the forgiveness of sins is to be preached and to be taught and to be lived. It's very important for uh, it's, very, it's such an important foundation because of off of this, you spring into the next part, which God has for you. Um, on the day of Pentecost, we know that um, Peter was pretty, uh, he was the go-to guy, it seems. Um, when the Holy Spirit fell, um, the people in the, um, well, first of all, he told them to wait. And when they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, he didn't say how it was going to come. He just said, you will receive power. And why were they waiting? I'm sure there's still a lot of talk about his resurrection. There was a lot of talk about things that he had said about before that they were starting to get. Um, but they were waiting. And um, that is something that, in part of the fruit of the Spirit, it talks about um, patience and waiting. And as we move into this here, we'll realize that the fruit of the Spirit is so important for us to recognize. But the people in the upper room, they waited, the Holy Spirit fell, and when it came upon them, they were uh, praising God, speaking in languages that they had not been formally trained, and people came to the window, they heard this, said, what's going on? And guess who shows up? Peter. Peter with some swag on him. Peter, I mean, are you kidding me? Yeah, says, um, and he goes on here, and he said, let's see, I'm just going to take a couple of them out of uh, Acts 2. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and, and says, fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you, listen carefully to what I'm going to say. Is this the same Peter? Peter that just cut off an ear? Peter that just denied Christ three times? Remember that Jesus restored Peter, too, at the lake there. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Christ restored Peter. Peter knew repentance. Peter knew forgiveness. But Peter still was trying to break into something new. Why am I so frustrated in this following Christ? And I'm, I've been with him for three years, and I'm still frustrated. But things are changing, folks. Something's changed. And whatever they were waiting for, what they were the promise from on high, the power of God to land upon them, it hit Peter. And it hit the apostles. And he says, and just his posture, his position, he also goes on in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the hearts and said to Peter and the other disciples, Brother, what shall we do? Here comes the message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for your children, and all who are for far off, and all whom the Lord will call. And through many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. Wow. Peter, yeah, I mean, the guy is just on fire. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. And there's more. There's definitely more. Um, Peter did not know what to expect that morning. He did not know he was going to go to that window. He had no idea. He would probably been just as happy hanging out in the back and let somebody else do it before he sticks his foot in his mouth or cut off somebody's ear. Who knows what he was going to do? But Peter, you know... Something was changing. And uh, there's another part. It goes a little bit further. Uh, one day, Peter and John were going to the temple 
at the time of prayer. This is chapter 3, Acts 3. At 3 in the afternoon, now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, and he, and he, was, and he was put every day to beg from going to the temple. So when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now keep in mind, Peter had not planned this, but he was ready for it. Something told him he was ready. Peter looked straight at him as did John, and Peter says, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them. It goes on, wow, dude. I didn't plan that this morning on my list of things to do. That wasn't on my list. So Peter, in this new swagger, there's something there that wasn't there before. And I want us to go, and I'll turn to it, Galatians 5.22. And there's some things in here in the fruit of the Spirit that Christians are entitled to, which we need to recognize that we have a greater dose of these now, or a fuller dose, than we did before we followed Christ. And the fruit of the Spirit is... Um, Love, joy, I know it by heart from a song. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But wait for it. But wait for it. Pete, you know, when it comes to these things, sometimes we have to wait. You know, they wait in the upper room. They, there's some patience there. Um, do we realize that the fruit of the Spirit is part of our swagger? It is. You know, to have love for somebody that's not lovable. To have joy when, you know what, why are you so happy? Well, <laughs> um, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control, gentleness. You know, when, so when Peter was waiting there, put yourself in there. Let's say that you're, you know, who knows what you've, where you've been, and all of a sudden God gave you a nudge. And you went over and you talked to somebody, you prayed with somebody, or you were there just to stand next to somebody. I had a friend, John Heinzer, when I got saved, he was a, a friend of mine, and he was uh, definitely in a rock and roll. And he said one day, he says, you know, Pat, I know something's changed. He says, because the only music I used to listen to was rock and roll. He says, now I listen to worship music. I mean, that's about as foreign as it gets for somebody that's a rocker. Um, you know, it's, um, and be honest with you, I, I was a, I like the oldie goldies, and sometimes I still do, but you know what, they don't give me the, uh, I can't listen to them for a long time. It just isn't in me anymore to do that. The other day, I, I was a Beach Boys guy, and I liked the Beach Boys. I really did. Little do scoop him. And you know, but if I listen to them for a while, you know, eh, that's not what it used to be. But the worship this morning, I love, because I love him. He has saved me. I repent it, and he's redeemed me. And my swagger that I have now is to the Lord. And, you know, the, the longer we walk as a Christian, we realize that the greater it looks to, to walk toward eternity than it is to look back to where we came from. You know, the line of eternity is very thin. From life to death to go into the next adventure, the next journey. You know, this is a kingdom journey. If you guys, um, I heard that mentioned the other day too, a kingdom journey, and I'm a journeyman because I've always liked to travel. I've always, uh, born in Cincinnati, moved out to Seattle, went back and forth, went to Jamaica many times. Um, in my journey, I was um, 35, single. Looks like I'm not going to marry. Okay, God. You know, I th actually, I thought I was going to get married at 30 first because that's when Jesus began his ministry. <laughs> then at th and then at 33, well, I'll be married by 33 and a half. <laughs> nope. So really, God gave me peace about it. And um, I'd been to Jamaica like three other times, and I met a group in there, and I met Molly. And it was like, God, are you serious? <laughs> it was good. It was good. And I was, you know, who would have thought in this journey I would have married uh, a woman of color, 2,500 miles away. That's the journey, folks. 
got some swag going on here. She gives me swag, folks. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, man, on this journey, you know, Peter's on a journey. We're on a journey. And to have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. You know, the Bible says, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And if, you know, look for the peace. Look for the patience. Take advantage of it. I mean, it's ours. It's part of the ammunition that God gave us. And there's another one that Peter exercised, and that's called the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, when I was in my life, I was weighing out um, whether I wanted to, I, I had a list of my priorities, and I was 22. And my priorities, and I mean I wanted cars, house, I wanted uh, a a lot of property with a runway on it for my airplane and a place to race cars. I wanted a car trailer that I could put my cars and travel around. And on the bottom of my list was God. And I sat there and I, I thought, you know, this thing is wrong. It's upside down. It was. And I just, mm. And then somewhere I read here in, um, about the, the gifts of the Spirit, not the fruit of the gifts, and it's now to each one is manifest. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge. To another means by the same Spirit another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same one Spirit. To another miraculous powers to another prophecy, to another one distinguishing between spirits or discernment, to another different kinds of tongues, to the other interpretation of tongues. These all the work of one of the same spirit, and he gives them to the one just as he determines. Peter and John were walking by the gate, beautiful. In that moment, God says, Peter, tell him. What I have, I do not have silver and gold, but I have you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. Miracle. <sighs> Gets up right through Peter. Didn't plan on it. Wasn't thinking about it. You know, but just, you know, walking it out. Just walking it out. And, you know, you guys, we are walking out our faith. And um, we're not supposed to, you know, sometimes we are, we, like we hit a wall. It's frustrated. But, you know, wait, there's more. And when I say the word wait, you know, um, just being real, that whatever God is talking to you or talking to me about moving into a more fullness of the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, I believe that there's going to be a place where God will bless you and just smother you with His love and the baptism and the Holy Spirit to where you're just going to say, And you know what, in um, traditional teaching, they, you know, there is an evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but something that when they were waiting for the Holy Spirit, they didn't know what the power looked like, and it hit them. And you know, um, it was powerful. And it could be powerful for you and I. Um, Oh, I might as well hit the one more here, Peter. He just, I like this here. So he heals, he heals the, uh, the lame man. And so the Sanhedrin, the, uh, the guards of the temple, didn't like it. So they bring Peter in, and um, they're questioning him. And the priests and the captain of the temple guards and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put him in jail until the next day. But many heard the message, believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers and elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other men of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power? What name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, I can't guess, he says, rulers and elder of the people. I don't see a fisherman saying that. Rulers, I just see a fisherman the before saying, if you don't like it, just get over it. 
He didn't. He, so, you know, he just waxed eloquently. You know, God gives you wisdom and knowledge. These, oh. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we were being called to account today for an act of kindness showed to a cripple and asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, by whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone the builders rejected, which is the, has become the capstone. They're talking about Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Whoo! Swagger, baby. Swagger all day long. Not that he was expecting it. Not that he made his swagger. But Christ in him, the hope of glory. It's the natural presence, you know, God in us. And um, we are the salt of earth. We are the city set on the hill. You know, Jesus started and began his ministry with repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand. And, you know, if I started to do a study and I started to get distracted about the kingdom of heaven, and the Matthew Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, and there's some radical things talking about the kingdom of heaven, what it's like. And it talks about those on the righteous and those the unrighteous and where they go. He talks about uh, those that will enter into heaven and those will not enter in heaven with wailing and gnashing of teeth. Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real destiny for many people. It's what Christ preached. I didn't preach that. Christ preached that. Repentance is the beginning of a journey into heavenly places, the kingdom here and now a place of power, a place of display of God's anointing on each one of our lives. If that's what we choose, you know, really choosing to follow Christ, to go to the next step. You know, Dr. Phil says, how's it working for you? And, you know, we can say, how's it working for you? You know, and so the neat thing about serving Jesus is that you can totally blow it and find restorations and pick right up where you were. Sometimes, though, we have, because when we blow it, sometimes we have to reap what we've sown. You know, sometimes our sicknesses, sometimes our hurts and our pains. But uh, God is so good, God is so gracious that um, there is um, great restoration. So I have written here, if you desire to leave a life of following Christ, in frustration to following Christ with fulfillness, fruit of the Spirit. Um, there is repentance daily. Amen. There is kingdom focus. Yes. Kingdom focus means really praying, reading the Word of God. You know, if I find any benefit in when somebody asks me to preach is that I have to dig into the Word. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, there is power in the Word. There is power in reading the Word of God. There is joy in reading the Word of God. Um, I am so amazed that God has... How is it that the God of the heavens and the earth, the God of creation, the God of the universe, has chosen to use the words of the Bible as an avenue for us to enter in through faith to live a life where nothing else, I mean, we would not have been able to have gone there if it wasn't for this. You know, if it was not for the Word of God, I, folks, I would have not gone to Jamaica. I mean, I went there to minister with children to play my guitar and do puppets. How simple was that? But it was a gospel message, and it went into, you know, a life where, wow, I mean, you, you, you don't know tomorrow, but God knows tomorrow. And there is a life ahead of us prepared for us that uh, is for greatness. You know, um, my prayer has been for many years is God let me fulfill my days. Um, as a young child, I knew that I wanted to be married. I wanted to have children. 
I knew that there was a call in my life as a young child, but I re rejected it because, one, I was raised Catholic. I didn't want to be a priest, but I didn't know that not what God was calling me to be. He's calling me to live for him. And, and, you know, and that's what God calls us, to live for him, to follow him. You know, I mean, it's, it's so good. It's a journey. Um, um, let me, I said, repentance, kingdom focus, and the fullness of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit. You guys are going to have to um, decide if you want to take the next step, if you want to wait, see if God has something else for you. See if God, ask, see if God has something more for you. I believe he does. In fact, I know he does. <laughs> I know he does. And uh, when that happens, um, it'll be the, the second best day of your life. The first best day of life is when you ask Christ into your life. The second best day is when you have the fullness of the Spirit in your life, to have the fruit of the Spirit evident, to have the gifts of the Spirit. Um, I was um, probably a half a year old in Christ. I was living in Everett, Washington, and I was driving a white blazer, and one day I was, uh, Wednesday night, I was, went to the store to go in, and I went in there, there was like a foyer, sliding doors here and here, and you went in there, and there was a guy sitting with a suit, a young guy, just didn't look good. I walked in and got my food, came out, and he was still there, and my blazer was right out front, I went in there, and God put the word suicide in my heart. Lord, I don't want to go back in there and talk to that guy. I don't. But it didn't leave my heart. Went back in. Say, hey, my name's Pat. I'm a new Christian. I don't know what God's doing with you. Please tell me that I should pray with you. Long story short, he was in a situation, he was at another church group, they confronted him about a sin in his life, he felt so bad, he left, he wanted to kill himself. So we prayed, and he, uh, they, went, they lived way down in Puyallup, so he came back to the house, he spent the night, and put him on the bus the next morning, but I wasn't planning on that. But because... I'd ask God the fullness of the Spirit to live in me, whatever that meant. Made a difference for him, made a difference for me. It still does make a difference for me because that's where it's about. God meeting my needs, God meeting your needs, our needs. If it hadn't been for that, I would never, I would have just kept walking. That's his problem, dude. I don't know what to do. I'm going home. I'm going to eat my dinner. But, uh, wow. And um, there's been other times I've missed it. And this seems simple, but it was still. I was going to work one morning. Every Saturday morning, I go to work from school. I went to Bible college, and I would get my big breakfast, and I was in my Volkswagen Rabbit. I'm sitting at this light. And there's this guy sitting at the bus stop there, and God says, give him your food. Not my, not my big breakfast, Lord. I didn't give it to him. I went on. His prayer probably was, God, I'm hungry. What would happen if I wrote down the window and gave him my breakfast? Changed his world. Blew him right out. God, you're real. Peter said, silver and gold I have not, but what I have I give you. Man, if God tells you to pray for somebody, pray for him. If God tells you to give somebody something, give it to him. Just give it to him. Because um, it'll come back to you. And, um, you know, this, God gives his spirit to us. I feel sorry for people that struggle day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. The Christians should not have to struggle. They're the joy of the Lord is our strength. Come on, folks. We're in this. We're in this for eternity. Let us dig in. God, I pray, if you got something for me, I'm willing to wait for it and receive it. Because, God, you desire to bless me and that I can be a vessel used by you. Amen. This journey, this race is not for the swift. It's not a fast race. 
but it is erased, enduring. And I, I heard this, uh, does, it applies, but it's never too late to make the right decision. In our life, it's not. You can always make the right decision, even if all the other ones were wrong. Make the right decision. It's never too late. Uh, so considering seriously where we're at, where we want to be, it's my way or God's way. It's something that we have to choose and that we, uh, we can choose today. We can weigh it out. Pray about it. Seek God about it. But somewhere we're going to make a choice that God, I'm, that I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. I love a journey. <laughs> God, I love a journey. Um, I wish my life, why well, I wish my wife liked to camp out and hike. <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> but you know what? We're on a journey together. We love the Lord. Um, when I first uh, saw my wife, um, actually I saw her on a Saturday that next Sunday, she led worship in, in our speech. She didn't know, but uh, <laughs> it has to do with being sensitive to the Spirit of God. And um, not that God told me that she was going to be my wife, but man, when she sang, you could tell she loved the Lord. The song was, I will rejoice in thee, thee and be glad. I will exalt your love more than wine. Draw me unto thee and let us run together. I will rejoice in thee and be glad. That's from a psalm, I believe. But in Jamaica, they don't sing it once. They sing it a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> and about the 50th time, I started to cry. <laughs> So, it's the journey, and um, God invites us all to the journey. The last thing he told his disciples is, but wait until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, preaching the kingdom of God, repentance, and the remissions of sins. You know, that's, it seems like, it's really simple to me. It's that, and waiting, and being filled daily or however, but um, life can be tough out there, folks. And um, this week, I felt as though as I was preparing, I have a new guy at work. His name is Lincoln. And we're getting to know each other. And, um, you know, um, I don't know if he's ever been around. He's not a Christian. Um, but he sees me. And this week, I, you know, the joy of the Lord was really my strength. And it was, uh, I felt it. And it was good. And, you know, it was a tough week. I mean, we had a lot of work coming in. And get a lot of work out, and we had to wrestle with a couple issues there, but hey, um, the joy of the Lord's our strength. So I guess I'll close with that, and um, I can pray for you guys. We can pray for one another, however, but I think this afternoon, it's a point of decision. God, do I want more of what you got? Do I need more of your fruit and more of your gifts in my life? Do I want to take another step? Am I ready? And if I'm not ready, Lord, make me ready. Show me, Lord. God is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will not force himself on anybody. But God wants good things in our life. So.